Good afternoon. My name is Karen Ray, and I am the Ward 4 Councillor in the City of Markham. I would like to welcome you to Session 7 of the International Online Summit, Becoming Public Art. This exciting nine-week event is presented by the City of Markham in partnership with Art Plus Public Unlimited. I would like to open the proceedings with a land acknowledgement. We begin today by acknowledging that we walk upon the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples, and we recognize their history, spirituality, culture, and stewardship of the land. We are grateful to all Indigenous groups for their commitment to protect the land, its resources, and we are committed to reconciliation, partnership, and enhanced understanding. The City of Markham is very proud of its heritage and has four individual heritage conservation districts, Buttonville, Markham, Thornhill, and Unionville. One of the committees I sit on is Heritage Markham, where we review and make decisions on all applications, not only within the districts, but also on all heritage properties, regardless of their location. The Markham Museum, repository of much of the city's history and site of many heritage buildings is located within my ward. For these reasons, I'm interested to learn more about ways that heritage can be addressed in contemporary public art in a time of changing geographies and demographics. Now, over to the two co-curators, Markham's Yan Wu and Rebecca Carbin of Art Plus Public Unlimited. Well, thank you, Councillor Ray, for the welcome remark and the city's uh, videographer, John Lee, for preparing this video. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yan Wu, Public Art Curator for the City of Markham. Thank you all for joining us today, especially everyone returning from previous sessions. Um, hope you like the program we put together and that we will see you again in the last two sessions. Cannot believe it, it's only two left. Um, the idea of organizing this summit directly arises from the Markham Public Art Master Plan 2020 to 2024. When we were about to bring the plan forward to the City Council for approval, we tried to strategize on how to raise awareness about the potential impact of the plan, and more importantly, figure out the best practices to implement it. What are the models and how to move forward, especially for an emerging public art program like ours, still in the process of developing infrastructures and procedures. We thought, why not create an occasion to gather all the great working models in one place and to study them together. Moreover, we wanted to hear everyone's voice along the production line, from artist to curator, planner to architect, designer to fabricator, creator to administrator, conservator to spectators and advocator. Public art making is a collective effort that demands highly complex processes and negotiations. So when the City Council approved our plan, we brought public art consultant Rebecca Carbon on board to design a summit together with us. It has been an absolutely wonderful experience. Thank you, Rebecca, for your knowledge, insight, and passion. And above all, your firm belief in public art. Um, originally, the summit was supposed to be a three-day in-person event back in June. Because of the COVID, we changed to an online format. It turned out that we're able to reach a global community. My sincere gratitude to those who have reached out with encouraging notes and feedback. It feels so good to know there is a community of colleagues out there who care about the same issues. Looking forward to more exchanges and discussions. Hope this summit is just a starting point. Before I hand it over to Rebecca to introduce today's session, I would like to say a few thank yous. Thanks to everyone at the City of Markham for making this summit happen, the amazing team at the Varley Art Gallery, and the great support from the team at the Corporate Communication IT. And thanks Kay Pettigrew for the captioning service. Lastly, but most importantly, just like with our artists, there wouldn't be any public art. I want to thank all the presenters of the summit. With all you making your projects happen and sharing them with us, that wouldn't be the Becoming Public Art Summit. Thank you. And now over to my collaborator, Rebecca Carbon. Thanks, Jan. It's also been such a pleasure to collaborate with you on pulling this program together in the various forms that it's taken over the past year as we hashed out what this program needs to be in an ever-shifting context. Thanks everyone for joining us today from wherever you are. We're thrilled to be sharing today's panel and program with you in our session seven, Site Specificity. Uh, we'll have pre presentations today from artists Maggie Grote and Paul Wong, as well as Arts Administrator Randy Neeson. 
Each presentation delves into particular projects in a reflection on the form and function of site specificity within public art projects and practices. We will then have a conversation um, between, moderated between our three panelists by artist Annie Wong. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce our moderator for this session. Um, and for those of you who have joined us for previous sessions, thank you again for continuing to join our conversations. You'll have heard this before, so bear with us. But after the moderated conversation, we're going to have a Q&A from the audience. Uh, to submit questions, please use the Q&A box. It's at the bottom of your uh, Zoom window. And I will be monitoring these questions, uh, triaging them and feeding them to Annie's so that they can be addressed once we open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, Site specificity is such an important part of the public art conversation. Artists are often asked to mine the specifics of a site in order to tether, work, tether their work to a physical place. For administrators and commissioners, this is often considered uh, to significantly heighten the work's importance or value. And for artists, this gives the work a clear set of parameters within which to focus um, or define their creative expression. Public art is asked to do the heavy lifting of placemaking, as we discussed in our previous session, and placemaking might actually be seen as site specificity with a future focus. So obviously the importance of site specificity means artists are often asked to make site-specific work, but what does that mean? We surely uncovered by this point in our summit that publicness is not simply a spatial definition, but a site is not only defined by the physical parameters of space or even the layers of time and narrative within a certain footprint. Projects we're looking at today explore a desire for site-specific work in different ways, through different forms, different temporalities, different modalities of engagement with different outcomes and even different goals. Our session today is the seventh in our nine week summit program and we're really excited about the lineup. So please join us for uh, the rest of our program, which is only two sessions left, uh, which are temporary programming and digital public art commissioning. Um, I'll paste the registration link into the chat here so you can put these into your calendar and sign up for our remaining sessions. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Annie Wong, uh, our moderator for today. Annie is a writer and multidisciplinary artist working in performance and installation. Conceptually diverse, her practice explores the intersections between the political and poetic in everyday life. Wong has presented across North America and has held residencies with the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Power Plant and the Varley Art Gal Gallery of Markham. Her recent literary works in poetry, art writing, and nonfiction can be found in the Yishu Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art, C Magazine, Canadian Art, and Mice Magazine. Welcome, Annie. Hello, thank you for that introduction, Rebecca, and thank you, Jan and Rebecca, for hosting these conversations. I'm very excited to um, begin this uh, conversation and engagement in these really deep topics with our speakers today. And our first speaker is Maggie Grote. Um, Maggie utilizes a range of media to integrate methods, methods of collage and salvage practices. Informed by her scurrere and settler backgrounds, her role as a mother and the impacts of the Anthropocene, her current research surrounds site responsiveness, shifting territories, decolonial ways of being, indigenous futurism, gardens, slowness, margins, and the transformative potentials of found and ritual materials. She's a visual studies lecturer at the University of Toronto and lives on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Chanantan, and Anishinaabe. Through strategic mobilizations of collage methodologies and alternative forms of research, Maggie Grode is interested in the formulations of site responsive uh, works that call attention to deep time, shifting territories, locational identities, and possible futures. Focusing on a selection of recent projects, including a look at the lake uh, by Art Metropole in Toronto in 2014, Deep Time Portals, Particles and Poles from Army Street, Toronto, 2019, and STS. STS at Western Front in Vancouver from 2017 to 2020. Gret will discuss approaches and considerations around what it means for her to engage site, site, specific, site specifically and what she has learned from her engagements with place and time. So without further ado, Maggie, take it away. 
Thank you, Annie, for that introduction. And thank you to Rebecca and Jan for inviting me to um, present today. So I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. OK, so um, uh, my talk today is going to touch on uh, the three projects that Annie um, uh, mentioned in the introduction. Um, and I'm going to unpack what it means for me to engage site specif spe specifically. And I guess take you through a bit about what I've learned through these kinds of engagements in the past um, years and through um, these focused projects. So um, I thought I'd start with this image of the lake. This is an image that I took around um, 2011 um, of this horizon line. And so um, the work uh, around Lake Ontario that I've done upon you know, the years of reflection that comes um, really has acted as a kind of anchor for the, the development of my thought um, when, when thinking about place and what makes a place. When I was in grad school, I spent a lot of time they're thinking about and researching and making work about moon. And I think um, I was a bit sad about this kind of insurmountable distance between myself and my subject. And so when I left Guelph and I returned to live in Toronto, um, I found myself engaged in this deeper relationship with Lake Ontario. And like, this was a place that I had really just grown up calling the lake, a place that, um, you know, I could be enveloped within, um, but also like moon um, was a horizon line. Like I was really attracted to this horizon line. And, this, and through this horizon line, um, I felt a kind of connection to, um, you know, both the past and all the people that it had um, come before me and then, you know, the, um, the future. And I was really interested um, in the ways that this place had seemingly Kind of been unchanged, although um, it had transformed in many different ways. And um, I was really interested in um, its relationship to traditional territory and um, what kind of relationships it had now to both human and um, other than humans. So um, after looking at the lake, uh, this project resulted and this is a book that was published by Art Metropole in 2014. Um, I called it an alternative body of research. And this is really uh, the beginning of, I guess, culminating things that were coming from a lot of disparate places into, into one kind of singular form. And so this work included um, both existing works and new works by a number of artists, including um, Diane Borisato, um, Julian Agam, Simon Starling, Dwayne Linklater, uh, Tiziana Lamelia, you can see some other artists uh, on this list here. Um, so this is a, an excerpt of Tiziana Lamelia's work. Um, this is an excerpt of Simon Starling's contribution, looking at the work that he did um, um, for the power plant. Um, this is uh, an excerpt from Julian Agam's work. Um, and so you know, at this point, I was considering the role of publications and how they had the potential to act as a kind of exhibition in themselves, or I guess how they might um, be able to unfold into spaces, including homes and institutions and walks and other landscapes that they might travel to, um, as well as how they function, including as parts of larger exhibitions. So in this case, um, this image that we're looking at now is an image of um, drinking, drinking the lake um, shown at Art Metropole um, in conjunction with the launch of the publication. And um, so a lot of questions that generated this work included elements that continue to be really central to me when considering who the work I make is for and how they might be able to access it. So I'm really interested in the spaces um, that promote greater visibility. So whether this is like, you know, the, the book traveling to these um, domestic spaces or institutional spaces, 
or in someone's backpack um, or um, a work made in public. But also I was thinking a lot about exhibition spaces that have windows that kind of straddle this space between um, you know, uh, an interior exhibition space and people in the community who are passing by. Um, and again, you know, just this idea of um, accessibility, things that might be familiar, things that might be transportable. So these are all um, ideas that I had, especially thinking about also this potential for a kind of longer duration of engagement or um, the intimacy of an encounter. And so um, one thing um, that I, you know, was really interested in was where water is coming from into communities. And so, you know, the, the tap water is coming, is sourced from, um, in Toronto, is sourced from Lake Ontario. And so here I created these vessels from uh, discarded materials that had been cut and sanded down and um, sort of invited people to look through the book, uh, consume, consume the lake physically creating this intimate relationship with um, um, uh, this you know body although it was actually quite a distance away and so there's just a kind of greater view of how the publication um, you know interrelated with these other elements of um, social engagement so the publication itself was informed by a number of things um, Obviously, I was really interested in my own location and my own relationship to um, the land that I'm from, to traditional territory. Um, and, you know, this particular site is not only surrounded by waters, there's, you know, um, St. Catharines is this place where it really is bordered and bisected by so many waters and um, bridges. Um, but I was also so interested in this thing that I remember being told as a, as a kid and then later was a subject of lots of research was this idea that the land itself that I lived on was, you know, fully submerged by water, was under the water. Um, so it also created a number of other works as a precursor to this book. One was an audio work that I created for the site of Fort Mississauga um, that's on the southern shore of um, Lake Ontario. This was made in 2012. Um, and it was called What is Older Than the Lake? So with this work, I was um, looking at, you know, these considerations of colonial ways of looking and being and how to counter or address these kinds of dominant historical narratives that are in place in these particular locations. Um, and what happens when these areas are so linked to particular historical events? And um, what does it mean to kind of, I guess, attempt to cover, uncover um, marginal or overlooked ones. So my central contribution to the lake um, enacted this kind of uh, form of the field guide. It was called Lake Ontario Almanac and it took a multidisciplined um, encyclopedic uh, approach to compiling and I guess in a way almost um, fragmenting or collaging this kind of curious research that I was doing around Lake Ontario. So brief entries um, are written under headings like art, architecture, as you can see here, um, around communication, currency, here we have mineral, movement, resource, and sport. And so I was really interested in how to take this single thing, this like the lake, right, but to look at it through a number of different lenses. And, um, and with this, thinking about, well, where are the gaps? What's on the margins? How do I bring this idea of the lake um, into the conversation itself as a kind of self-determining entity or sovereign body? Um, so at this time, I had been considering a number of questions and these continue to kind of act as threads or concerns that I um, continue to think about when I make work, which is how can scattered interests or a tendency to dabble in this kind of fractured way of researching be filtered into artworks? What is gained through this um, intertwining of disciplines and where are these gaps? What happens when the boundaries between these categorizations collapse? What does the lens of deep time offer? What does the role of deep and speculative, what is the role of deep and speculative futures? How do I respond to place? 
And in doing so, how do I move gently on and with the land? Um, what can I learn from a place? Who is here? Who has been here before this? Um, what will be inherited? And I think, I, you know, a question I've already kind of talked about is who's my work for and um, um, what can I offer to the communities that are accessing this? Um, so all of these questions um, can, are the questions I was really reflecting on and thinking about, um, uh, you know, they continue to inform how I approach and respond site specifically to place. So, it, you know, I was looking at the seminal text on site specificity by Maiwan Kwan, one place after another when I was at grad school and um, the way that she outlines the paradigms of site specificity. So these paradigms, you know, the phenomenological, the historical or institutional, um, but in particular, the discursive came at for the way I research sites. So kind of the zooming in and zooming out of locations, what is both visible and present, but also what is perhaps not seen, um, uh, but still present. And considering how this kind of tangential um, uh, research can you know, be drawn together, however tenuous. So this image is another um, work that I made for the book. And this um, uses the scanner as a microscope to use these found examples of um, images of the lake. Um, and now they're being enlarged. So through these processes of searching, I was really interested in how to disrupt centered or linear notion of time and space. How to harness these first two paradigms in the service um, uh, of like wandering or waiting or swimming, or hopping, meandering, these kinds of modes as a kind of strategic resistance to, um, uh, you know, in opposition to other strategies of pinning down locational identity. So the next work I'm going to talk about is um, STSTS. I was invited by Pablo Diocampo at Western Front in Vancouver to undertake a research res residency. And um, this ultimately culminated in uh, STSTS, which is a public site intervention, uh, publication, also um, related events. And so as I'd been previously making a lot of research-based work that was responding to these locational identities, um, of Southern Ontario and of its relationship to traditional territory and to deep time, um, you know, I was faced with a new challenge of what it meant to do this in another location. Um, I had been giving a series of lectures and making related works that were trying to consider and subvert how this history is being told and who is telling it. Um, and this included works that I had made for Mercer Union and a series of works that I had made for Robin Hall here in St. Catharines. Um, but with this invitation, I, you know, to the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Hunkaminam, and Skohomish, I was confronted with a new kind of responsibility. Um, and even though I had lived in, um, on this unceded territory before, I was still, I kind of felt like a new sort of pressure. Um, a, or a weight of that responsibility and really began to question what the role of outsider or as uninvited guests, um, uh, uh, how those things, how that affected the questions that I was asking when it, and when it came to make a work. So what kind of new perspectives or new understandings was needed in order for me to offer a work that would be, you know, presented to this community. Um, so this image here is a from a um, map that I had found of the lot before the building at 303 East 8th was built. Um, and you can see that the corner of this proposed lot um, borders a uh, creek. And you have this beautiful kind of notation going through the lot that um, refers to an embankment. So, um, you know, I wanted to begin here with this kind of, um, relationship to this site. Um, but I was also interested in um, alternative ways of researching. So I think fundamentally one thing that's really important to talk about is that those at Western Front were really interested in engaging and supporting a relationship with an artist over a longer timeline. So just through this longer timeline alone allowed for this kind of deeper engagement with place and community. So I began a month long residency in 2016 and continued um, 
uh, through on-site and remote research in both 2017 and 2018. And um, I just really think it's so incredible that the institution gave this opportunity to me um, as a mother with, at the time I had two small children. And then over the course of the project, I had three small children um, and they were able to accommodate my family so they could be in residence. And I think that this was not always easy and I really appreciate and I'm so thankful for, for the gen generosity and flexibility that they showed me to see this project through. So um, I'll just, this is what the picture, or this is what the final work from the facade looks like. Um, so it had these small interventions. You can see the painted triangle at the, at the top. Um, there's a illuminated triangle um, towards the left. Uh, this um, mirror um, uh, that had, was at an, another location on the building kind of migrated to this other location. And then one thing that I'll, I'll as I advance, you'll see the um, boulder that is in the ground. Um, but I really wanted to privilege the experiences and stories and encounters that were happening in real time, not only just like traveling to archives or looking at this archival material. So the research took, you know, traditional and alternative forms. So this looked like meeting with members of the communities in the surrounding areas. Um, this included founding members, members of the Western Front, members of the Musqueam Na Nation, um, of neighbors, artists, gardeners. And this happened through walks, um, you know, in conversations, including a guided walk of a renaturalized stream on the Musqueam Nation, um, a directed tarot card reading, of the site itself that was framed as a kind of reading of the past, the present, and the future. Um, I did a lot of gardening with others. Um, you know, this invitation into both personal and public archives. And um, as a result, the work is a kind of conversation and collaboration with so many um, people, plants, the water itself, um, objects, images. And so like I know we're looking at the pub, the, just the work on the facade here, but um, there was so much information to diffuse. So I was really overwhelmed with the, what to do with everything. So I was like, you know, how do I create a bridge or a lens or how do I filter um, or compile or refract this information so that others can engage and activate um, uh, a work. And so what resulted was, you know, really looks at this precedent of the lake. I created this small field guide. Um, it was a free takeaway and um, the scale of it is so small that it would fit in, you know, um, a small pocket. And because I had so much material um, stiff to, you know, I really was challenged with the strategy that kind of tried to equalize the relationship between what was perhaps recorded and um, these things that were also being found through um, oral or other experiential means. Um, and so I used these symbols as a way to um, guide that, um, all, you know, that relationship to, to all of these things. Um, and so the book takes a kind of collage framework. It's got a cut and paste method with regards to the text. It's very fragmented. Um, but I think one of the really central things that are important to point out about this is that I didn't include any images. So in place um, of the images, I would create these sort of, um, I actually don't think I have an image of that, but I would create these um, uh, text-based description of those visuals. Um, and so, you know, this work really relates to, especially the work on the facade, was what does it mean to be asked to travel to a place? And um, is it possible to kind of make with only what I then find on site? And so the work on the outside of the building was made with materials largely found in the basement of the building, um, uh, with exception of the solar panel that was installed on the roof that illuminated the triangle um, on the frame made from discarded lumber on the site. So here, there's images of um, uh, that. Um, so you can start to see the relationship, the visual relationship being drawn between the things on the exterior of the building and this kind of um, guide that leads you through the book, um, through all of these layers. And so this work is really interested in, in how we can maybe use these symbols as a kind of wayfind, wayfinding device. 
they became these kind of containers for me that could point to many things at the same time. And um, as we'll see in the next work that we're going to move on to quickly, I was really interested in and continue to be interested in the idea of portals and how um, this notion of the portal points to these other places in time and space, but that perhaps are still connected by the matter and energies that are present um, uh, at a current location. So those are the two other that are um, sometimes hard to see. So this was actually, the, the square work was actually originally on the front. It, it was a notice board that had been on the front of the building for many years, but it was the exact same scale and shape as the window that's immediately on the um, alternate side of the building. And so by placing it here, I was imagining a kind of through point um, into the foyer of the building. And so to launch, um, the facade, just the work on the facade, and to launch the book, um, Western Front hosted me for an event that um, was a combination of a walk and a reading. And so um, I started at the um, point of the now undergrounded creek, the beginning point. So this is up at 42nd Street, and it doesn't take a you know, a straight line to Western Front, but it actually meanders and, you know, we kind of had to backtrack at one point. And so we take this very peculiar walk um, uh, as a group of people mimicking the flow of um, the water that, you know, is undergrounded now through the neighborhood. And um, at certain points I would stop and I would read excerpts from the book um, uh, and including at this point, which um, Oregon Great became a really important um, plant for me during this research. And you can see so many, at so many points along this walk, these thriving examples of this um, riparian um, plant. Okay, so I know I need to wrap up um, here. Um, this is just the last work that I wanna look at really quickly, which is Deep Time Portals, Particles and Pulls. And this was made in consultation with Rebecca Carbon. Um, and it's currently installed on the site of the construction hoarding at Armory Street, Toronto. And for me, this is just a really um, uh, important work to kind of end on because it shows the example of how something could be um, research-based, but through a totally different result. So here we have a really similar research process include um, in terms of mining history uh, of uh, this particular location. But in uh, the final result becomes this primarily visual, um, um, visual work. Um, and so to make a work like this, it involves so much printed material. Um, and I spent a significant amount of time um, looking for this visual material in order to um, unpack the work. And um, so, you know, this, this final work proposes, um, um, Again, this idea of portal um, and a, as a way to access um, uh, times that are not necessarily represented here. And so I'm proposing this idea of these fragments being situated somewhere between layers in the soil, the museum cabinet, and the night sky, um, which are here kind of orbiting but tethered to a kind of imperfect symmetry. So to wrap up, um, you know, I think a work like this, for me, I'm really interested in how to mirror the realities of the world as a kind of influx, ever-changing, um, layered, or multifaceted place. Um, and how can I do that through both, you know, text-based strategies and um, visual strategies that promote, or I guess, touch on this kind of active resistance to this notion of the singular, centered, or coherent. Thank you so much, Maggie, for sharing um, your work and your project. So many interesting ideas that I'd, I'd love to really get into. But I just want to share one thing while you're presenting. I'm really intrigued by this emotional investment um, in your work and your collaboration, especially when you say um, that you're interested in showing what is not seen. And it compelled me to pull the sticky note from out, out of my off my wall because um, it related so well, and I'll just read it very quickly, and it's by James Baldwin. 
and the quote is, the role of the artist is exactly the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. So it was just chilling. It was so chilling I had to put a sweater on. <laughs> so speaking of um, love, the next speaker's works is um, uh, works I completely love, and that is Paul Wong. Paul Wong is a media maestro making art for site-specific spaces and screens of all sizes. With a career spanning four decades, he is an award-winning artist and curator who is known for pioneering early visual and media art in Canada, founding several artist-run groups, including Vivo Media Art Centre, On Main On the Cutting Edge Production Society, and leading public arts policy and organizing events, festival, conferences, and public interventions since the 1970s. Paul's Wong, Paul Wong's presentation today will focus on a recent series of multidisciplinary art, uh, public art projects in Vancouver's Chinatown. They will include Sum Joy Tan Yang Gai, Occupying Chinatown, that featured engagements created during a long year artist residency at the Dr. Sun Yat Sen Classical Chinese Garden in Wong's Chinatown studio from uh, March 1st, 2018 to March 31st, 2019. Prideinchinatown.com is now an annual festival celebrating Pan Asian LGBT, LGBTQ2 art and culture, of which Wong is the artistic director. He currently has in development The Sounds of Chinatown, a sound installation, and the Occupying Chinatown book, which will be released in 2021. This illustrated talk will be live from Wong's studio in the heart of Chinatown. Whenever you're ready. Hello, thank you. Um, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Um, thanks for having me be part of this panel on public art and site specificity. Um, you know, I work both as a, an artist and also as a facilitator and as a curator, and mostly as a facilitator and a curator has been um, a parallel activity, which is also often frowned upon by other facilitators and other, and other artists and um, uh, other um, administrators. The, you know, everyone wants you to be one thing or the other. But as an outsider who always felt that there was um, uh, a lack of embracing of other forms and ideas and communities, this uh, parallel activity has been um, very important to me in the past and continues in the present to um, identify and work and develop silenced and marginalized communities of creative expression. Um, so um, today we are um, uh, on Coast Salish territories. I am in the heart of Vancouver's uh, sadly dying Chinatown. Um, um, you know, um, this is a project that I did in 1990 called Yellow Peril Reconsidered which was a major um, exhibition featuring uh, contemporary photo, um, uh, film, and video artists that toured to, uh, internationally and to 10 artist-run centers uh, in, in Canada. Um, and it certainly, um, even back then, you know, there was no community. Doing this project um, was sort of creating a fake community of looking into what um, a pan-Asian contemporary photo film uh, and video artist um, could be doing. Um, through that effort, you know, a dialogue and a community was formed against all kinds of resistance. So a lot of my practice really has been about um, um, claiming space. Um, uh, uh, claiming public space, uh, and, and a lot of that has been um, due to rejection of institutional spaces, has been locating new spaces and, and new communities. I'm just going to go to my, what I'm going to do today is just whisk through a number of projects and to give you some background to um, 
my artistic process and the context in which the work is done. Because for me, context uh, is everything. Um, I'm gonna go to full screen. Thank you. So this first work here is called Windows 97. Uh, it was commissioned in 1997 for a, an exhibition called Fortune Cookies for the Institute of Contemporary Art in London, England. Um, I selected this particular room um, um, because of its architectural features and I wanted to insert a work that um, used uh, the window spaces in this rather grand colonial room. Um, Fortune Cookies had invited a number of uh, international um, Chinese artists to kind of address um, the handover, the, the, the reunification, of, the handover of Hong Kong uh, back um, to uh, the Chinese governance. Um, so for this work, I selected um, the iconic image of Mao and an iconic image of Queen Elizabeth the monarch, both what I consider to be um, problematic, iconic um, uh, figureheads. And in the middle, I created three um, animated, which means they flash on, flash off um, uh, with different elements. Um, the top represents um, China, an empty bowl of rice, uh, the red st a communist star, and a, a AK-47 uh, machine gun. The middle um, is, represents Hong Kong, money, uh, the, 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 the new logo, which is this flower, and uh, in, in Chinese, one country, two system, and the um, bottom neon um, f f flashing is a, 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 the sign for nuclear uh, energy and military power. Of course, the Union Jack and the Crown. On the outside, um, I created um, uh, the Irish Republic uh, flag uh, because the ICA uh, operates, um, uh, is situated on Paul Mall, which is the main road that leads to Buckingham Palace. So I wanted to insert, um, you know, something about, you know, the history and legacy and the problematics of British colonialism that in fact still exists today in, in Ireland. So that was, this work, Windows 97, was created for um, um, fortune cookies. Uh, next, um, we will see um, another iteration of um, uh, Windows 97. These neon works were inserted into the Ting, the highest point in Dr. Sen Yat-sen Gardens um, in 2010 as part of my series of um, five, five hour uh, Winter Olympic events. Um, uh, and, and for this five hour event, I took over the Dr. Sen Yat-sen Gardens in the center of Chinatown and created um, a series of events outdoors and in their pavilions um, using light projections. Um, I think I, for this work, I created like uh, curated and created about 14 um, uh, types of works uh, for this event. Um, uh, this is the mural um, um, in the center of downtown Vancouver uh, promoting the five, uh, five hour events that I did during the Winter Olympics. This was the first time the city of Vancouver had um, made available um, artist initiated projects. That is that there was a call that the artist uh, could um, completely initiate what they thought would be a public art project. Um, I proposed that I would present, produce, create and present five, five hour events over the five um, weeks during the opening and closing of the Winter and Paralympic Games in 10. And 
The first event was a five-hour podcast or a webcast uh, uh, with Skeena Reese, uh, a co uh, my co Salish uh, uh, co-host, and we did that um, like a five-hour uh, television live show. The second event was a chartered um, video bus uh, with, with uh, that went through uh, urban Vancouver. The third was a event at the highest point in Vancouver, the Lokdal Conservatory. The fourth event took place in a cemetery. And the fifth event, which closed out, uh, which dealt with the five elements, was at Dr. Sun Yat-sen uh, Classical Chinese Gardens. Um, in um, 1997, for Windows 97, it was the first time that I had actually worked with Neon. Um, in, in 2011, I started to work with Neon again, in, uh, which has continued in a much more robust way. What you're looking at here is nine full moon drawings. These Neon shapes are, uh, are actually tracings of um, photographs or drawings uh, made on my camera, um, drawing using the full moon in Nicaragua. When I looked at the, these rather uh, streaky photographs, I realized that they would make very interesting um, neon shapes. Um, this work is currently being proposed. There's actually 21 um, of these drawings, these shapes, these attempts to write um, these squiggles um, is now being proposed um, as a major uh, public art artwork. Um, this is, um, oh, I got this crazy message here. Uh, your video is, just in case you have some bandwidth. Okay, I've got some message, sorry. Um, Year of GIF. Uh, 213 was commissioned by the Sur Surrey Art Gallery for their urban screen. And this is a series of, um, uh, uh, of GIFs uh, that I created as this five minute looping work. It's a silent work that's projected on this recreation building, which the subway, the SkyTrain whistles by. Um, there's uh, like 300 um, uh, GIFs that I created uh, over the last year previous to that, uh, it just turned out that um, the word GIF was the um, word of the year according to one of the dictionaries. Um, this is just stuff that is really um, mined um, from my social media platforms. So it's a, it's a work that covers every day the personal, the intimate architecture, shapes, noise, technology. Uh, this was an early video mapping project in 2013. Um, this was a uh, commission um, in 2016 for the Audain Art Museum. And it's called No Thing Is Forever. And it is it's constructed of um, a steel armature, which you can barely see. Um, colors in color spectrum, uh, the uh, English alphabet in cursive, which is my handwriting, and um, the Chinese uh, character eternity, which is prime, basically constructed using the seven or eight basic strokes used in Chinese color calligraphy. Um, this work um, is really about um, language, colonization of language, colonial languages. Here, obviously English, and on top of that, or behind that, um, in Chinese, eternity. When I was approached to do this um, commission for the entranceway of the Audain uh, Museum in Whistler, BC, um, I was struck that this museum um, um, was going to be built with a 200 year lease. 
and that the oldest work in the Aldean Art Museum collection was going to be uh, some Aboriginal work dating back 200 years. And I realized that in 2016, I was at the center point of this 400 year history. Um, this work was really made to be viewed and appreciated 50 years from now. When I told Michael Aldane that, you know, they're no longer teaching curse of anything in, in most um, schools around the world, uh, he was quite shocked. So, you know, people aren't, aren't, don't know how to do cursive anymore. And, and cursive was designed um, from, so one could write very, very quickly. So I'm very interested to see in 50 years where we are with cursive languages and also what is dominant languages uh, in, in, in our, our territory. Um, this was also um, inspired from um, uh, my mother's um, found notebooks. When she came to this country, she was learning English in night school. And she had these English language books where there was the English and on top of it, she, very carefully, she would write uh, Chinese. So no thing is, is forever. The title uh, really uh, means nothing is forever. Um, I see when this building falls down that maybe the only thing left rusting away uh, in, the, in the dirt is going to be the steel armature. Um, this was um, a commission um, by the um, Vancouver Opera Company um, uh, in 217. Uh, five octave range is um, a four channel uh, video installation with sound uh, created for the Queen Elizabeth Theatre Plaza, uh, which ran for several weeks in, in 217. There are four um, performers, um, uh, what are called non-traditional opera performers, um, uh, uh, many of them queer, many of them Three of them women, one um, uh, um, is, is in drag, um, and then is also a French Canadian ma man. Um, it's very abstract, it's um, very loud and bombastic. Um, it's a kind of a deconstruction of what I consider to be the most essential elements of, of opera, which I find quite stuffy when you go into um, these epic theatrical productions, which are three hours long. So I really wanted to, to, to create, um, working with these extraordinary voices and performers, um, this kind of um, uh, very bombastic, very powerful um, work that was available uh, on the plaza. Um, this work is actually currently um, posted up on my Vimeo channel, Paul Wong Projects. And this work was just recently presented um, as a single channel work for the Toronto Art Fair this past month. Um, this is um, uh, another uh, video mapping project called Winners and Losers in 217, projected uh, on the facade of the Vancouver Art Gallery. And Winners and Losers is a, uh, a construction of footage before, during, and after the Stanley Cup playoffs uh, in Vancouver in 2011, uh, um, where the Canucks lost and there were riots on the streets and uh, riots taking place um, actually right on this plaza. So this was kind of a reinsertion of the madness of all, all, all of that uh, back onto this kind of uh, colonial uh, structure, which used to be a courthouse, which is, which is now the art gallery, which is now the, the central plaza in, in downtown Vancouver. Um, okay, um, we have this neon, uh, Chinese only, in Chinese only. This is one of the first works I produced during my occupation, um, Chinatown, um, occupying Chinatown residency, which started in March 
218 and actually continues on to this day. You know, I wanted to make a sign that said Chinese only in Chinese only um, kind of um, uh, uh, in reference to whites only and uh, in direct reference to the uh, um, legislated municipal, provincial, and, um, oh, two minutes left. Um, here is Chinese only as a um, uh, series of television bumpers done on an urban screen. Uh, Chinese only um, was part of occupying Chinatown, which was a residency um, at the Dr. Sanyasin Gardens, where I got to produce a lot of workshops, engagements, uh, festivities, and um, works of art, a lot of it inspired by 900 letters written to Sok Fong Wong, who is my mother, over 60 years. And these uh, letters were found uh, in her private quarters after her death. I can't read or write, so part of inability to do that has been about making this series of works, which has included um, 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 celebrating, documenting, and making public her collection, her 90 jars of Chinese herbs and medicines, which has resulted in a series of public artworks, including um, these billboards, um, um, workshops in all three languages, in Chinese herbal stores, in Chinatown deconstructing uh, one of those elixirs in her collection, um, uh, soup making workshops here at Dr. Sanderson Gardens. In the background, you can see some of the scrolls I made with letters. Um, here is the, the latest iteration of uh, Mother's Cupboard's Jars, uh, which um, have just opened uh, at the Vancouver Museum. These private jars have become museumified and as part of a, a huge exhibition um, um, acknowledging 200 years of Chinese Canadian migration. And this is Everyday Things, a, a, a recent public artwork that changes um, uh, over the course of a year or two with these backlit photos. And this is also commissioned by the city of Vancouver. And this is called Everyday Things, where I'm responding to, to, to my collection of these vintage um, materials, um, old, uh, old books, uh, and um, these vintage um, sign language uh, Chinese cards. And finally, we have Saltwater City, Ham Sui Fa Wang Guo Va, which is um, what the Chinese, um, until quite recently, uh, the Cantonese, um, with, with, with the name for Vancouver. If you traveled anywhere in the world, and you, in Chinatowns, or in Southern China, and you said, I'm from uh, Ham Sui Fao, they would know that Saltwater City meant Vancouver. And the last uh, three words are, is phonetically so, the Chinese could say Wang Guava, Vancouver, which actually translates to mild, warm, older brother Chinese. Um, this was exhibited at Dr. Sun Yat Sen Gardens, and I also photoshopped this work onto 16 buildings in Chinatown. And um, through various meetings and discussions, uh, there was a voting process where people thought, where should this sign be permanently installed? This is now the permanent installation site um, for a saltwater city, Vancouver, which is the uh, a laneway between Maine and Hastings, sorry, between Hastings and Pender, and on the rear of Force 725 Main Street, which was the site of the original city hall where they first instituted and legalized discri you know, discrimination against the Chinese anti-Asiatic bylaws, which continued until quite recently. And my um, year-long residency uh, 
uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen Gardens in Chinatown, um, started on April 22nd, 2018, the day that the, the city of Vancouver finally formally apologized to the Chinese community for the 100 plus years of legal discrimination. And we close with Pride in Chinatown, which is now that was um, an ongoing festival where I've created a context um, for the Pan-Asian um, community to claim and celebrate uh, pride in Chinatown. That's it. So I had to race through that. <laughs> that was incredible, Paul. Thank you so much for sharing such a prolific portfolio of your work. I'm so excited for um, Occupying Chinatown 20, the book to come out in 2021. And yeah, so many ideas. And especially as myself, as a Chinese Canadian artist, you know, thinking about, you know, your initial statement um, that you make communities form out of resistance. And I think also how uh, built environments and even neighborhoods are um, built out of resistance like Chinatown itself. And so I think that really um, is a great segue to introduce our next speaker, uh, Randy Neeson. Randy Neeson holds a BFA from Alberta University of the Arts and is currently pursuing a MA in Arts Management and MFA dual degree from Claremont Graduate University. He has experience in artist-run centers, festivals, and municipal art programs, and is currently working at the City of Calgary as a public art coordinator. Randy has been involved in many acclaimed public art initiatives, including Watershed Plus and the Calgary Chinatown Artist Residency. Randy's work, uh, talk today focuses on Calgary's Chinatown, which is currently at a crossroads. The neighborhood is facing increasing pressures from developers wanting to access the area's valuable location while its community is advocating to preserve its distinct and important, uh, important cultural identity. This tension has been a catalyst for community stakeholders and the city of Calgary to work together on significant planning documents that will aim to shape the future of the area. Through this, the Calgary Chinatown Artist Residency was created, an opportunity that embeds artists into the community to research the rich history, culture, and built environment of Calgary Chinatown and its current social political context. Eason will shed light on the process of this residency, how it not only allows the artists to create new works in response to Calgary Chinatown, but also to influence the civic planning documents underway. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm presenting from Calgary or Mokinsis, the traditional territory of the Treaty 7 people. Um, and as Annie said, I'm going to be speaking on the uh, Calgary Ch Chinatown Artist Residency. I might also have my video cut um, while I'm presenting because my internet has been a little bit spotty, but we'll give it a go. So, um, as I said, this is the Calgary Chinatown Artist Residency. Oh, and uh, it's a latest initiative presented by the City of Calgary's Public Art Program in collaboration with the New Gallery. Uh, this residency came about um, because we were initially approached, uh, as the Public Art Program was initially, initially approached. Uh, by the Tomorrow's Chinatown project team to discuss engagement opportunities. The Tomorrow's Chinatown project is a development of two critical plans specific to Calgary Chinatown. It includes a cultural plan and a local area development plan. Together, the aim of this is to work to help shape the future of the area. This was sparked after development applications raised concerns over how new developments would impact the authenticity and identity of Calgary Chinatown. With development comes the risk of gentrification um, and community groups have been coming together to advocate for the preservation of Chinatown, working closely with the city of Calgary um, as they embark on this Toronto Chinatown project. 
We saw a role for artists in this conversation and thus the Calgary Chinatown Artist Residency was created. Our objective for this is to embed artists in the community and explore the rich history, culture, and sociopolitical context, engaging with the community of Calgary Chinatown as they envision the future of the area. Um, for this, uh, when we're talking about site-specific work, I think it's really important that with public art, the context of the place is always considered, regardless of the nature of the work. For this to happen, we need to provide artists with the knowledge and resources to understand the people and place they are engaging with. And in this instance, it meant us getting a deeper understanding of the history of Calgary Chinatown, its community and stakeholders, and the Tomorrow's Chinatown project. As we were developing this residency, we looked to inspiration of past initiatives on how to kind of build a model on what was the best way to build contextually relevant um, site-specific works. As you heard about earlier in the conference, if you had attended previous sessions, um, one of the speakers, Carolyn Bowen, had shared the um, Utility and Environmental Protection Department's public art plan. As part of that, uh, there's the Watershed Plus program. I was fortunate enough to work on this. Uh, one of the initiatives from that was the Dynamic Environment Lab. Uh, watershed Plus was aimed at creating emotional connections between citizens and their watershed. And with Dynamic Environment Lab, we really wanted to give artists the opportunity to understand the really complex nature of civics, the civic government's role in managing the watershed and being an environmental steward. Uh, in this, we developed a lab week where artists, uh, five artists came together to um, kind of cover a wide range of topics that went into what went into managing such a challenging environment that Calgary exists in. Uh, here, the artists are at the Bow Glacier. This is the head of Calgary's um, source of drinking water. Um, after the lab week, each artist developed proposals on how they wanted to address the topic of dynamic environment. So each had very different um, project proposals. This one in particular was from Becky Shaw, who was really interested in working with the leak locator crews who manage um, the sounds of the underground. And I'm really sorry you can hear that. There's construction happening at my building. So <laughs> there's a buzzing happening right now. Um, so this was a demonstration that Becky Shaw had given uh, to the public on how to use a tool called a geophone. And this uh, basically is like a stethoscope where uh, trained technicians will place these on the ground and they can, by listening through the device, detect where a leak is happening. Um, this is Steve Gurish, who was really interested in um, kind of artifacts found along the banks of the watershed. He took digital scans of things like rocks and found objects and the rocks included things like graffiti on them and then went on to make a 3D print um, in ceramic of these objects. And the 3D printer captured things like the graffiti. So this was an event we held last year where Steve was firing the objects um, in this uh, trench that he built in a park in Calgary. So that really provided kind of the model on how we wanted to approach this. Um, a way in which we could really give artists the full context of a place before they responded to it. Um, in order to make that successful, we really had to embrace subject matter experts. Uh, even for myself, who has basically grown up in Calgary my whole life, I surprisingly knew very little about Calgary Chinatown. Um, so we engaged in partners with the New Gallery. It's an artist-run center who's really a pillar for visual arts in the uh, Calgary Chinatown community. Uh, through them, we really were able to make a more fulsome um, opportunity for artists to, to really uh, connect with uh, subject matter experts, uh, site specific or sorry, specific sites that were really significant, um, and just kind of get in a, a more thorough relationships built through their connections. Um, is also about hiring the right artist for the right opportunity. Um, we issued a call to artists that was open to anybody to apply. Um, the call was translated in both Mandarin and Cantonese. And we had a total of, I think, over 125 artists apply for the opportunity. Uh, we had three artists selected, uh, Annie Wong, Teresa Tam, and Cheryl Wingsy Wong. 
who were all hired based on uh, qualifications and a letter of intent they submitted, which kind of gave our understanding of why they were interested in the project in Calgary Chinatown in specific. We also had uh, the benefit of being embedded into the municipality as a public art program. And through that, we were able to utilize relationships through arts and culture, planning, heritage resources, and parks to be a resources to artists. Um, in addition to having community stakeholders like the Calgary Chinatown BIA and different community associations. Um, the really important part of this project, and I think the most crucial component, was the programming week, which was, uh, as I said, based off of the Dynamic Environment Lab. This gave us an opportunity to give artists um, a really thorough understanding of various topics that really kind of weave together to give context and identity to Calgary Chinatown. Uh, working with the new gallery, we were able to develop a program that covered a wide range of topics. This included Calgary Chinatown history, cultural identity, the built environment, heritage resources, and social exploration. Um, a huge part of, of a kind of understanding the history as a sidebar was that uh, the city's heritage resources team uh, was able to uh, develop a Chinatown historical context paper. This was uh, this is a really incredible document. If you have a chance, I would suggest go Googling it. Um, it gives a really thorough overview of the history of Chinatown, the struggles it's kind of endured, and some of the current challenges it faces right now. Um, so this is an example of kind of some activities. In total, the artists participated in over 40 activities throughout the five-day program. Um, this included things such as presentations and guided tours by subject matter experts, um, dinners with the community, as you can see here, we're at the Regency Palace um, having dinner with the project team. We ate a lot of food during <laughs> this week. Um, it also included um, doing recreational tours. So this is the Malaysian Singaporean Bruneian Community Association. They were hosting a ping pong tournament that day and they were very for, um, generous enough to offer lessons to uh, the artists and ourselves. We had demonstrations from local artists. This is Stephen Kwok who was giving a demonstration on um, stone chop carving. And on the right here is a presentation by the, I think it's the planning department, um, kind of giving a bit of an overview of tomorrow's Chinatown project. Uh, this is the artist doing a tour of the Chinese Cultural Center. And this is Dale Lee Kwok, or sorry, um, I have that name wrong, I know, I just can't find it in my notes. <laughs> um, Uh, she's giving a tour of sites around Calgary Chinatown, and she uh, shared some of her poetry um, at certain sites. So this is Seenock Park, and this specific piece is the Wall of Names. Uh, it's celebrating Chinese people coming to Calgary and the struggles they endured. And I actually was right, her name was Dale Lee Kwok. Um, so yeah, that the the, the program week really was a critical component in developing uh, or guiding the artist into more site specific works. Um, the intention of it was not only to kind of build the collective experience of Calgary Chinatown and a deeper knowledge of it, but also kind of uh, providing an opportunity for people who might not have ever experienced Calgary Chinatown to, to care about it. Um, so following the program week, the process for that was that the artists were given the opportunity to do, digest what they experienced in that five day um, intensive program and really think about what specifically they wanted to respond to and what resonated with them in order to kind of guide a line of inquiry for the actual residency. And part of that not only is building context, but it's also about making the most efficient use of time for when the actual residency was starting. So instead of um, taking time in the residency to start building relationships and understanding of the place, they already kind of got a jump start on that by providing by participating in the program week. Um, and so each of the artists have submitted proposals 
and have very different approaches to how they want to utilize the residency and develop work and then continue to engage with the community. Uh, we were planning to start the residency in April of 2020. Um, and due to some scheduling conflicts, one of the artists, Cheryl Wing, Wingzi Wong, was able to start in January to get a bit of a head start on it. Um, and unfortunately, right as the residency was kind of geared to start, we were hit with COVID-19 and the pandemic has completely shifted the trajectory of the project. So um, we felt it was best to, um, to really kind of get the full opportunity out of this. We didn't think it was possible to complete it with social distancing in place. Um, community engagement is really a critical component of this residency. So we made the decision to postpone it until 2021. Um, the artists have all been in communication and we're still working on plans to develop things for next year, but the plan is that the residency will commence in May. Um, and we will be providing them all the resources necessary to really kind of fully invest in that experience. So the artists will be here for three consecutive months. Um, we were originally planning to provide them housing at the Clover Living Assisted Living Facility. Um, this would give them a chance to integrate with the senior citizens in the area. Um, depending on how the pandemic rolls out by that time, we might have to figure out alternative uh, accommodations uh, being that it's a higher risk community in the pandemic. Um, we're also providing them artist fees, a stipend, a material budget, and travel allowances. Uh, and we'll also be providing them a studio space to take advantage of for the three months that they're in residence. Uh, along with that, we're also planning a documentary piece. So we'll have a filmmaker shadowing all the artists, capturing the process of the work and the residency, um, and that will be available to share next year. So um, that concludes my presentation. I think I'm a little bit under maybe, but um, yeah, so everything is in progress. Uh, I was hoping, you know, we in a normal circumstance, we would be sharing kind of the outcomes of this residency, but yes, due to the pandemic, we're, we're delayed till next year. So next year, you can check in online for um, kind of the results of what happened. Well, thanks so much, Randy. It's so weird to uh, see images from exactly one year ago when we were, we were together. Um, and so now I'd like to invite everyone to kind of come back on screen. We have um, a series of questions that we'd like to ask all of you from um, all of those amazing presentations. Um, and thinking, um, firstly, thinking about due to, to site specificity, what does site specificity mean if we think about site as an ever-changing condition? Hmm. So we're just gonna jump into the discussion. I've almost predominantly always worked site specific. I'm not a studio based artist. You know, I don't make uh, art for the commercial gallery system. Uh, I don't make a lot of permanent artworks. My practice start out really being an uh, experimental video artist. And um, the idea of public art, you know, with obviously many of us moving in the, the same directions, you know, we've, we've moved past murals. We've moved past concrete and bronze monumental plaza works um, that projects can be community engaged and they can be ephemeral. They don't have to last forever. And I certainly I know, know that my year long plus residency occupying in Chinatown is actually being in Chinatown with my studio, working with institutions. And part of my creative process has really been to not just claim every day things like my mother's jars or a piece of writing, but also claiming um, um, ordinary sites and making them public. You know, getting outside of the institutions, getting outside of the gallery, getting out, outside the usual mural wall. And I think that has um, um, been part of, of the work of 
of trying to create this new context and for others to start thinking that it's not about the big moments. Sometimes the, sto the story is there in the, in the everyday overlooked things that make up what is the community. Chinatown or any community or other things is made up from everyday activities. It's not one iconic patriarchal historical thing. It's not one act as one action. Um, so that's kind of been what I've been looking at. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I love that uh, response and thinking about um, the livingness of a public space and the livingness of, of a site. Um, yeah, any other responses, Maggie, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I really like this idea that Paul is pointing out about the idea of like what could be temporary or in flux because the three works that I um, presented today and the last one I, I didn't do justice because I ran out of time but um, um, this, those, all of those works are temporary right like they kind of go up and, and come down and, and I've um, never made a permanent work and so that's an idea that's really important to me as well as this idea of um, I guess duration and engaging on, on time scales that could be brief. But I think, you know, with regards to your question, um, that's exactly what I'm really interested in thinking about, right? How do you speak to histories and presents and futures if, um, you know, there's a kind of, uh, you know, endless layers um, and that they're constantly shifting and unfolding. And, um, and I think that last project um, for Armory Street that we just briefly looked at um, is really um, making visible how the city changes and how the city is changing. So as I've documented that work, the, the building behind it, the site of the courthouse is actually changing behind it. Um, so I think that that's just a really interesting illustration of um, how cities are made and remade and what happens to these fragments and um, you know, pieces of um, the past that are perhaps still present. Mm, yeah, yeah. I think um, you know, breaking the silence, and I guess you know, you know, from my early practice, you know, as doing media democracy has continued certainly with something like my mother's letters. Mm. And she represents a whole generation of women who are silenced by patriarchy in Chinatowns silenced by discrimination. So those, they've been, vis they've been invisible. Mm. Matriarchs um, um, in general, and specifically here in Chinatown, uh, have been deadly silenced. Um, and and um, their stories have been unheard. Mm. Their moments have been unheard. Their, their presence uh, has not been, um, 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 appreciate it and the contributions and, and those are what I call those everyday moments mm -hmm. like the jars uh, like you saw earlier bringing those jars to the studio and photographing them suddenly gave them so much power uh, elders because I have a seniors club here were coming and helping identify these jars and say they have jars like that at home they had never saw them um, with their ginsengs and with their root powders as, as, as something uh, significant and, and interesting. Suddenly putting those on a billboard and, and, and seeing those uh, presented in the kind of vitrine um, uh, generated so much discussion. Like what's in those? What do you do with those? Why is it in a mayonnaise jar? Why is it, we have Nescafe coffee cup jars like that. So it's, it's, it's um, that was you know, an accidental kind of thing that I stumbled on. And, 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 and just to see people so interested and excited about it was, was um, significant. And that's the only kind of thing that you can do through kind of research and taking risk and making um, discoveries like that. Yeah. I think to echo that, um, 
you were saying earlier, Paul, about it's not necessarily the outcome that's really what to focus on in public art, but it's the process of getting there. And I think in that process, um, you often kind of discover the untold stories or the unknown. And that in itself is like really important in kind of addressing the histories and the ever-changing condition of site, right? It's like, again, with the, the Chinese medicines, it's, it's, you know, I was taught, and I'm still decolonizing that, you know, our Chinese medicines is inferior to Western science and Western medicines. Doing those workshops and identifying those was to get people like myself and others to appreciate and to go into and support those shops. Demystifying um, uh, what, what we were told was exotic and weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it, it all really ties into, um, Maggie, what you said in the very beginning, like um, showing what is not seen, but also the politics, like who, who gets to see it and, who, and what isn't seen. And really, I think the work really does redefine a visual culture um, of sight and space. And I wonder, I think, uh, um, we don't have much time left, so I, I think we're gonna pull a question from the audience. And the question is, as a temporal public, as a temporal public artist, thank you, just a consideration if to cite Bachelard and all the spaces of our past moments of solitude, the spaces in which we have suffered from solitude, enjoyed, desired, and compromised solitude remain indelibly within us and precisely because the human being wants us to remain so. And then we expand upon. That's a very lovely quote. That's not a question. <laughs> but I, um, I feel like that's a beautiful way um, to continue uh, thinking about uh, our discussion. And Rebecca, do we have um, more time for our second question? Or is there a question that we are going to pull from the audience? Yeah, we're actually completely um, out of time. If you have oh. one last question you'd like to pose and give each person kind of a minute to, to respond, we could do that. Sure. Um, this is a question that, um, you know, Yen and Rebecca gave me three questions to ask, but I want to ask my question. <laughs> I really feel like uh, it resonates with all of your practice. And that is the, the idea of intimacy. Intimacy runs in all of your works in very different ways. Intimacy, Paul, with your mother's work. Intimacy, um, Maggie, with uh, the lake. And, and intimacy, uh, Randy, with the artists and the community. So how does intimacy uh, work in a public context, con context? And how do you use intimacy um, publicly? Well, I think Pride in Chinatown, I'm gonna just, it's been a really good example, is finally claiming um, uh, Chinatown as a site to acknowledge, celebrate, and embrace um, Pan-Asian uh, LGBTQ2 communities. Um, Pride in Chinatown 218 was the first time that Pride has ever been celebrated in Chinatown and, and supported by institutions. It was the first time that anyone can ever remember a pride flag been flown in Chinatown. So that, um, here we are talking about intimacy. You know, we're talking about sexuality, gender, and, and, des and desire. And it's become this very interesting lab for um, creating new types of what does contemporary pan-Asian queer presence and art and culture look like now. So that's I, really breaking the silence. I think I'm really interested in how to create or transfer, I guess, the intimate moments with place to um, individuals who might be looking at my work or looking at the work I've made. And I think about that, especially in the publications that I've looked at, um, that, you know, how does a relationship with a book and the knowledge within it um, how can that promote um, one's own looking or one's own layer or one's own discovery that isn't present there? Um, and so I'm thinking about 
you know, I, I like to think about the books traveling in the world and people's pockets and backpacks and, and going to spaces and, and, um, and being read and sort of activated. And it's hard because it's also something that I don't, I'm not, I don't have access to knowing about those relationships. And so I like to imagine these kinds of intimate encounters with the work in, in that level. Yeah, I think um, from my perspective, um, you know, commissioning these works from a municipality, um, there's an incredible amount of bureaucracy that goes into those processes. And I think one of our jobs is kind of how we navigate through that um, because they don't necessarily align with artistic practices, right? Um, and when you hire an artist for this kind of project, you're putting an incredible amount of trust into them to um, you know, respect the relationships they develop with the community. Um, we don't expect that it's just like a one-way relationship, it's reciprocal, right? So artists might kind of gather information and, and personal information and personal stories from the community, but it's like, how, how is that respected in a way that's shared authentically and sensitively? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big part of like a, a relationship building and just fostering trust and, and facilitating that through the process. Yeah, thank you so much for indulging me um, with those beautiful responses. Um, and I think at this point, I, I hand it back to Rebecca and Yen. Yeah, thank you, uh, Annie, um, for moderating the conversation and uh, introducing all of our panelists and keeping us moving today. Thanks so much, Maggie, Paul, and Randy, for sharing uh, your work with us and with your audience, with our audience. Um, I, I really like the fact that we're ending talking about um, about intimacy and public art practices. I often, I do sometimes think about um, art as a form of, of public displays of affection, um, which has, of course, uh, some, it's, you know, humorous, but also not entirely untrue, the idea of bringing those um, stories of human connection into um, a built environment. So um, the fact that an artist's practice can articulate these kinds of specifics in ways that position um, a site really in relationship with other specifics of place uh, can be defined not necessarily, not necessarily through form, um, but through populations, um, through use, through time, through networks. I loved Maggie's analogy uh, in her first uh, project of water and asking the question, where is water coming from into a community? It seems a really interesting way of thinking about site specificity more generally. Um, or, or Paul Wong's mother's uh, jars of fermented foods and kind of moving those to a bus, uh, to bus shelters and the unseen connections that are sort of drawn uh, there that are kind of really complex and, and deep. Um, and how to reflect on the world as an ever-changing condition um, as a place that is constantly in flux. What does that pinning that down mean um, in terms of trying to be site specific or finding some uh, means of site specificity are all really interesting things to think about. So thank you again for, for sharing all of that with us. So, and thank you all for joining us. We're going a little bit over today, uh, but before I hand over to Yan for our final remarks, a reminder that next week's program, which is our eighth of nine, uh, December 1st, starts a little earlier at 1.15 uh, uh, Eastern Standard Time. And that is because we have a slightly different program for you. Our session seven is on temporary programming, and we're kind of changing the script a little bit for the next session. Just when you were getting used to this format, we're gonna change it up. Uh, we ha will have a feature presentation on uh, the Toronto Sculpture Garden by Rena Greer, and that feature presentation will be followed by a Q&A specific to that project. And then we'll then do a kind of lightning round of project uh, presentations from uh, Alana Altman at the Bentway, Kari Swinar at Don River Valley Art Program, mm -hmm. and Tyrone Bastian. Toronto's uh, Biennial of Art. And curator Janine Marchessault will then moderate a conversation between these curators. So of course there will be an audience Q&A following that, um, but sort of different format and delving differently than we've done in our other sessions. We're delving deep into the particulars of kind of one topic at a very local level. So I'm gonna hand it over to Yan for our closing remarks. And thank you again for joining us. Great.
Great. And uh, thanks again, everyone, and for joining us. And uh, hope to see you again in the next two sessions. And as, mentioned, and as mentioned, all the sessions will be recorded and made available online and the summit website. And the recordings of last six sessions are all available now. And everyone who signs up for our live sessions will also receive our biweekly newsletter in which you will find all summit-related updates and a series of commissioned interviews conducted by our writer, Rosemary Heather. And this weekend, we will launch the last in the series, a three-part interview on the topic of public art in transit, including great conversations with a London-based public art curator, Marion Zulika, and um, on Toronto-based public art consultants, Ben News and uh, Brett Golden. Please stay tuned. And uh, that's it for today's session. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. See you next week and uh, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>